I have a lot of nostalgia connected to the old days of League. How bad could have the stories really been? On the frozen tundra of Desolia. Oh no. When it comes to lore, League of Legends was like a really bumpy roller coaster. It may be really good now, but that's definitely not how it was in the past. Its story used to be all over the place. And one of the reasons why that was the case was because Riot didn't have any unified rules as to how they want to write their stories. So each champion was pretty much written as if they were in their own world. Sometimes they tried to include open ties in their stories, but those ties never led anywhere. For example, a champion sometimes mentioned a side character, but that side character would never ever be used in any other story. As a result, none of the stories made a complete storyline, and everything was chopped into pieces that never made sense. Honestly, it feels like sometimes Riot thought that no one would read what they wrote, but here we are, 10 years later, discovering pure gold. So, today I want to present you a special video, because today we will go into the past, and we will look at the worst stories that were ever released for League of Legends. Most of these stories will come from the early days of the alpha version of League of Legends. These were times when Riot didn't have anything ready. They didn't know what the world looked like, they didn't know the names of any places. For example, Ash was from the Tundra of Desolia, and they didn't even know the main plot of their world. The Institute of War that was pretty much the foundation of the old lore arrived in the middle of 2010, a year after some of these stories were already written. So in case you have no idea what the stories are talking about, remember that the Institute of War and the League of Legends used to work as a gladiator arena. Champions were summoned into the Summoner's Rift, so they could settle their differences there, instead of starting nationwide wars. But honestly, you don't have to remember any of that. Just sit back and enjoy some of the nonsense from the past. I'll try to start with some of the better stories, as in the less funny ones, so we can finish this video with some pure gold. So let's just give you a taste of a bad story. Let's start with the very first iteration of Tarek. Tarek's father was a healer in their city, on a world far away. Yes, that is right, the first line in his story reveals that Tarek was from another world. Technically, he was an alien. Tarek was always interested in his father's pursuits, even from a young age. Despite his burgeoning understanding of herbs, plants and animal medicines, it was the power of gems that most fascinated the growing boy. What power do the gems have? We don't know. But it was the power of gems that Tarek was fascinated by. Gems are truly outrageous. <clears throat> anyway. It wasn't long before Tarik had exhausted his father's coveted library and set out on a path of his own. He wasn't to be a healer, but a defender, one who used the power of the earth to preserve and protect. Quickly, Tarik became a wandering knight, renowned across the land. Notice how the story doesn't even mention how he became renowned. He just did. That is, until the day a spell of summoning grabbed him from his home and deposited him on Runeterra. Now Tarik missed his world though he is happy to fight in the league, protecting all who are in need. Yeah, sure. He was ripped from his world into another dimension, where the entire civilization works in a different way, but sure, Tarek was happy to become a gladiator, to help the first person who asks for help. Well, let's move on. The next one I want to show you is the original story of Rise from 2009. Raised from the age of two, inside the Magi's Academy for Unpleasant Boys, Yes, the name of the academy was the Magi's Academy for Unpleasant Boys. Doesn't really have a prestigious ring to it. Rise has never really fit in with his peers, though his disciplinary record might prove otherwise. At the age of seven, Rise snuck into the professor's headquarters and used the bolt of electricity to singe the hair of the headmaster's prized poodle. Yips. Zap. See, you might think I'm lying, but that's exactly what the story says. Rai singed the hair of the headmaster's dog. The first ever prank in League of Legends, by the way. But it's not the only prank, because at 9, he mixed an ordinary laxative into a batch of fire breathing potions his chemistry teacher was preparing for a class field trip. At the age of 12, he disassembled the school zeppelin and reassembled it inside the library. Six months later, he was caught drawing runes of binding on every chair in the academy's editorium. It took two full days to unglue the entire student body after the Witch's Day ceremony. What... what does that even mean? Remember when I mentioned that Riot liked to leave some ties in their stories that never led anywhere? Well, what even is the Witch's Day ceremony? The final straw came when Riot picked a fight with the first tier professors. All of them. Though none of the new teachers were permanently injured, the resulting blast destroyed half of the school. 
Probably. See, some of the early alpha stories were lost in time. The leak wiki site managed to capture some of the parts that were locked on the original website. So you could theoretically data mine the old alpha stories, if you managed to start the old 2009 version of the original League of Legends website. This means that the version of the story that the leak wiki has is missing the end. Some of the stories are simply cut off. So unfortunately, we don't know how the story of Rise ends. Not that they could really top a scene where Rice considers reassembling a zeppelin inside a class a joke. So instead, let's move on to more of a strange story. The story of Vorik from the second alpha week of League of Legends. Vorik was once a brutal mercenary, trained as a chemical weapons engineer by the alchemists of Zorn. He barely escaped with his life, after his unit was wiped out while they were defending an Ionian castle. I assume this is after Noxus and Zorn invaded Ionia? But don't worry, the story never actually mentions why Warwick was in Ionia, or what he was doing there. And by the way, this story was released before there was a lore battle that would decide the outcome of that war. So the reader couldn't even know that Noxus invaded Ionia. The invasion was confirmed about half a year later. Anyway, outnumbered 100 to 1, he holed up in an abandoned mine, and he set to work concoctioning a chemical potion that would give him the strength and power to beat the odds. Hmm, yes. Deep in the gold mines, he started mixing up a potion of spit, rocks and dead canaries. No, seriously. How did he create a potion in an abandoned mine? Any clue in the story would be helpful. Oh well, let's continue. Knowing he didn't have much time, Vorik frantically finished his elixir, but he had no way to test it before using it. Swallowing the ungent in giant gulps, Vorik howled in pain as his body contorted. His arms grew huge and strong, his fingers sprouted massive claws, and his head horns. Yes, that is right, Vorik was supposed to have horns on his head. Inside a hunger grew, a thirst for blood that had never before existed. Needless to say, he was not the one who lost his life that day. Upon return, Vorik's transformation allowed him to excel as a mercenary, and his infamy spread near and far. So the story revealed that Vorik can create potions from thin air that turn you into a horned werewolf. Next story! After his update, some people consider the story of Ramus to be one of the best. But that definitely wasn't the case during his first iteration. The dangerous magic that dominates the Plaguelands has an effect on all life within its confines. Ramus is a living example. The Plaguelands, by the way, used to be a place that held a number of champions, such as this abomination. No one is entirely certain how an armadillo from the Shuriman Desert made his way through the Kumungu jungle, much less unharmed. But he did just that. You should remember the phrase, they did just that. Riot used to use that phrase every time they didn't know how to explain something. It was better to say that it just happened. Caught in a burst of wild magic, Ramas began to evolve. Where did the burst of wild magic come from? Or what it even was? We don't know, it just happened. In the matter of a week, he was man-sized. A week after that, he had achieved sentience. The question became, what now? There really wasn't a place in the world for a sentient armadillo. Except in the League of Legends. His new form was certainly equipped to fight, and especially to defend. However, it was Ramus' newfound sense of humor that led him to craft an outrageous suit of armor to go over his natural protection, giving birth to a fearsome armadillo. So, Ramus became sentient just because. And he found it funny to craft armor and put it over his own armor. That was his story. Yeah. I'm beginning to understand why people thought that the story of League of Legends was horrible. So, let's move forward. The next one on the list is Mordekaiser. The first half of his original lore is just speculations. The story says that some people think that he is just a man, and others believe that he is some kind of an undead creature. But the known thing is that he came from the Shadow Isles, and he just walked into the Institute of War to join the League of Legends. He did it without any reason whatsoever. The story says that he literally just walked in and requested to join. The only part of his story that makes any sense is the part where he describes his power. Originally, Mordekaiser used plague and disease as his weapons. That probably resulted in this line in his voiceover. Affliction forever. But besides that, the story doesn't say anything. He's some kind of an undead warrior who wields disease without a reason. The end. And if you like stories that don't explain anything, you'll like the next one. There are few dwellers, let alone champions, residing in the blasted and dangerous lands that lie south of the Great Barrier. Much of that world still bears the scars of the past rune wars, especially the mysterious Kumungu jungle. There are long-forgotten treasures in these strange places, which many risk life and limb to acquire. 
The champion, known as Nidalee, was only a young girl traveling with her treasure-seeking parents, when they lost their way in the dense rainy jungles. The jungle was unforgiving, and she watched her parents suffer agonizing final days, as they fell victim to a mysterious and vicious disease. Makes sense so far, right? Nidalee hunted for treasures with her parents, they all fell sick and the parents died. So far so good. But, as improbable as it was for a child to survive in the inhospitable jungle by herself, <clears throat> she did just that. Her youthful innocence and a fortunate naivety caused her to appeal to the beasts of that place, and she was taken in by a family of cougars and raised as one of their own. So not only did she not die to any sicknesses because of a miracle, the hungry predators of the jungle also didn't attack her, because of reasons. But on top of that, she grew and somehow absorbed the raw magics of the dense wilds, evolving beyond her human physiology and her feline affectations. <clears throat> she somehow absorbed the raw magic. Let me tell you, this is peak writing, but we are still not done. On one pivotal day in her life, standing over the torn remains of an Oxian squad of woodcutters, Nidalee chose to rejoin the so-called civilized world, to fight in the League of Legends as to protect the vast woods from both Demacia and Noxus. She looked at dead Noxians and she was like, yeah, I don't like them. Let me join the civilization which they are part of so I can kill them. This is pure insanity. Next I wanted to talk about Malphite, but he's not really that interesting. His original lore had one hilarious part though. Just like Tarik, Malphite was also from a different world. But on that world, all the creatures were just fragments of that place. In a sense, all of them were parts of their home. The funny thing is that Malphite was summoned across the cosmos into Runeterra, which was a whole different world. But out of nowhere, Malphite stopped caring that he is in a different place and that he will never return home. Instead, his primary goal became to stop the chaos of Runeterra, which again is not his planet. It is not his home. Why does he care? Anyway, let's move on. I have two more stories to show you. Let's start with the original Lee Sin story. Which, by the way, was written and released on the original League of Legends website in 2009. Remember, Lee Sin was supposed to be released as one of the original launch champions. So even though he was shelved and then re-released two years later in 2011, he did have a story already written in 2009. So let's have a look at that abomination. Lee Sin was born into an ancient clan of martial artists, the Melian Monks, whose fighting style harnessed the agility and power of the tiger. Also important thing to note, this wasn't what Lee Sin was supposed to look like. The traditional skin was supposed to be his original look. That explains why tigers were a big part of his story. Anyway, at birth, every child in the clan is given a tiger cub companion, which will accompany the monk throughout his training. Ragar, the cub of a proud and dominant tigress, was given to Lee Sin, and the two became inseparable. However, halfway through Lee Sin's life, his sight failed him. Um, sorry? Halfway through Lee Sin's life, his sight failed him. No, that's right, that's exactly what happens in life. Now you see, now you don't. It happens to the best of us, just like that. With Lee Sin's strength waning, the Melian monks were unsure if Lee Sin would be able to continue his duties as defender of his people. One night, as Lee Sin slept restlessly next to his tiger companion, Ragar appeared to him in his dream. Having great sympathy for his lifelong friend, Ragar offered to sacrifice himself for Lee Sin's future. What does that even mean? Lee Sin saw his tiger in his dream. And inside that dream, the tiger offered to sacrifice himself? Why would he sacrifice himself? How would he do that? He's a tiger. And what would he do it for? How can a dead tiger help a blind person? What's worse is that the story ends there. There is nothing after that. That's the end. This is madness. This cannot be real. <sighs> All right, let's calm down. We have one more story to go. But before that, there is one honorable mention. Let's go through Morgana's original story. Morgana Le, Kale's sister. Bitterly they fought for the title of Supreme Judicator. When Kale won, Morgana Le became disgraced and fallen. Oh, I thought it would be longer. Well, let's have a look at the updated version of Morgana's story. That was released two months after the first one. Morgana, Kale's sister. Bitterly they fought for the title of Supreme Judicator. When Kale won, Morgana became disgraced and fallen. Let's just have a look at the last story so we can end this video. Nunu's original lore. As a child, Nunu and her family. Wait, her? Nunu was a girl? Ah, surprising, but sure. 
Nunu and her family inhabited the northern fringe of Runeterra's polar region, spending their days ice fishing and huddling for warmth in the desolate landscape. Born with the ability to freeze the very air around her. Freeze the very air around her. So Nunu was the Yeti! And he was a girl. I mean, it makes sense because the Yeti was always the main character. Born with the ability to freeze the very air around her, Nunu became invaluable to her small village as an igloo builder, creating blocks of ice to form the foundations for the village's buildings. One day as Nunu sat patiently next to a fishing pole, she was startled by a massive starving yeti that burst from underneath the glacier and collapsed miserably next to her. So Nunu was Nunu, but Nunu was also a girl! And he was a frost mage! Feeling pity for the poor starving beast, Euralis offered the yeti a fish from her bucket? Who is Euralis? There was no mention of Euralis before! With wide eye, the eager yeti gobbled it down, feeling much better and the two became fast friends. Who became fast friends? Euralis and the yeti? The yeti and Nunu? Nunu and Euralis? What is anything? You know how good the writing has become when Zoe's original lore tells us more info than this. Hey, did you know that we have social media and Twitch where we talk about other league facts and stories? And did you know that we have need mugs and shirts too? The links to all of that will be below. And as always, thank you, come again.